From Microbe TV, this is Matters Microbial, a podcast about the wonders of microbiology, microbiologists, and microbial centrism. This episode was recorded on January 18th, 2024. Hello, Micronauts, and welcome once again to today's Quality Quorum. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Martin, Associate Professor of Biology at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Today, hooray, is the 25th episode of Matters Microbial. As always, I continue to be grateful for every listener, viewer, and commenter. First, yet another member of my Wunterkammer. Some years ago, a friend purchased me this wall-mounted small sculpture of a tardigrade. It is unsettlingly lifelike. I do, admit, I, w- I do admit I wish it was animatronic and waved its legs in response to noise like a billy bass. Still, it's a fine addition to my laboratory decor. Yesterday was the first day of my introductory cell and molecular biology course, Biology 111A. It is a very large class by University of Puget Sound Standards, 48, and I look forward to exploring biology with these students. Still, I was curious about the kinds of information the students had before the class began. So, I would ask them to write one-word responses to particular things I would present. When I prompted them with the word germ, here is their response. I have many thoughts on that word. Prompting them with the word bacteria gave this result. As you can see from these word clouds, I have some work to do to promote microbial centricity in my classroom. And we're going to revisit those prompts on the last day of class and see if their opinions have changed. Hope so. We have had several episodes on this podcast discussing the gut microbiome, ranging from Sean Gibbons to Suzanne Depkota. It is a fascinating subject. But who else lives in that interesting series of ecological niches within us? One issue that's become clearer in recent years is the role that bacterial viruses, bacteriophage, can have on the gut microbiome. Parenthetically, some years ago, I was fortunate enough to have a wonderful undergraduate student in my little laboratory named Danielle Campbell. She is one of the students who stays in touch with me regularly, and I must tell you that I consider her a valuable colleague and valued friend. I am so very proud that she has earned her PhD, had a wonderful postdoctoral stint, and is now getting ready to jump into the job market. Danielle has many interests, as you'll learn, but is quite interested in the relationship between bacteriophages and the gut microbiome. Welcome to our Quality Quorum, Danielle. It's truly a pleasure to see you today. Hi, Doc. Always great to see you. Thank you for having me. What's the weather like? Cold. Warmer today. (laughs) It's funny how uh, a little bit of contrast and suddenly 30 degrees feels tropical um, because we were truly frozen for several days here in St. Louis. I can't really complain, but our heater quit the other day. And so when your whole house gets cold, and it's not that cold here in Tacoma, as you know, it was really quite a thing. But it was was amazing. But guess what? My my wife, Jenny, fixed it. I married up, friends. Way up. Well, you've met her. You know. Oh, I do. (laughs) (laughs) So what I would like to do, I think, for most of our listeners and viewers is hear a little bit about what brought you to science. So can you talk a little bit about your background? Yeah. Um, so I don't know. My background in science really goes way back to being a kid. Um, I grew up mostly in my grandparents' house. And when you're 70 years old with a six-year-old and a four-year-old running around, what do you do but throw them out in the backyard to go and burn off that energy? Um, so I had my interests as a kid were gardening, plants, bugs, Um, animals. My grandfather was a pretty avid bird watcher, so I spent a lot of time with a pair of binoculars in my hand. Um, In high school, I I was also very artistic and creative growing up. 
um, which I know you can appreciate the uh, merging of creative energy with science. Um, so I, I originally wanted to be an artist. Um, I did an AP art class and actually my focus was ants. So I did a whole series on ants because I always really liked bugs um, and ants especially. Um, but then decided not to go that route, came to the University of Puget Sound. Uh, I worked in Peter Hodum's bird lab for a few semesters early, uh, early on in my undergraduate career, um, worked on the Puget Sound bird survey, um, but there wasn't a lot there for me to follow up on. There's um, a lot of questions to be asked in the avian world, but his lab was not prepared to follow up on a lot of them. So I looked for new opportunities and that's how I found you, Doc. Uh, so you put Della Vibrio in my hands, and Della Vibrio is, of course, this um, bacteria-eating bacterium. Uh, so it actually eats other bacteria by invading those prey cells um, and killing them. And I remember you telling me very early on that um, when Della Vibrio was discovered, they thought it was a bacteriophage. Uh, which fascinated me. And of course, bacteriophages are viruses that infect and often kill their bacterial hosts. Um, and it wasn't until some years later that they figured out that Della Vibrio is not in fact a phage, but a bacterium. So that was really my first foray into the microbiological world and dipping my toe into bacteriophage without actually working on bacteriophage. Um, after graduating from the University of Puget Sound, I uh, moved on to the University of Illinois where I did my PhD in the labs of, <laughs> in the labs of Patrick Degnan and Rachel Whitaker. Um, so Patrick Degnan's background is in Bacteroides, uh, a very common symbiont in the human gut microbiome. And Rachel Whitaker's background is in um, Bacteria, or sorry, in microbial viruses broadly, um, but especially archaeal viruses. So archaea, of course, are the other flavor of uh, microbe that we think about. So these are more closely related to eukaryotes than bacteria. Um, and she works on um, viruses that infect archaea that live in hot springs in Yellowstone. So taking those two ideas and putting them together, I began working on bacteriophages in the human gut, um, which we think have a lot of really important implications. I ended up graduating from the University of Illinois in 2020 in the midst of a very fun pandemic, yet another virus that impacts all of our lives. Um, came to St. Louis. Uh, I'm now at Washington University uh, School of Medicine in the laboratory of Megan Baldrige. Her lab does a lot of things, um, but all of them center around the human gut. So we have people working on human viruses like norovirus and astrovirus. Um, we do a lot of cell culture and tissue culture and mouse experiments, which was new to me when I got here. Um, so I'm very, very happy to expand my toolbox. Um, and then a growing portion of the lab now is working on bacteriophages in the gut. And we use a lot of emergent, emerging technologies to ask exciting questions about what these phages are, um, who they infect, and what they do in the gut. So a lot of what I do is actually uh, single cell sorting. So you put bacteria and phages into a very fancy machine, and it sorts individual teeny tiny uh, microbes with viruses attached to them. And we can talk more about that later. Um, but I very seldom actually even see my phages. Um, I'm not a big microscopist. I have some microscopy I can show you today. Um, but most of what I do uh, is just sequencing. Um, and I say just sequencing, but that's actually, I think, the fun part. Because uh, that's where you really get into not just what, what do these look like, but what are they doing, what do they encode, and how are they impacting their microbial hosts. I didn't know, actually, about your background with Professor Hodum. That's very interesting. Um, and you're right. I mean, it depends on the way that you want to ask and answer questions. And so I'm delighted you had some time to spend with Della Vibrio, which can be a frustrating system to look at, as I think you can agree. <laughs> 
Um, but I believe that it's it's and we don't have to look at it now, but you had something something to do uh, with uh, continuing to love that system that you're keeping with you at all times. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So the other thing that I wanted to say is that you never took microbiology from me. And no. I am I am routinely lambasted for brainwashing students into what I call the one true microbial faith. But the fact of the matter is it doesn't have to be that way, does it? You come to microbiology because it's a really cool system depending on you. Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah. I think there's something in microbiology for everybody if, if they're willing to try it. Yeah. One of the things that, that I was really touched by or, or thought about, thoughtful about was your comment of how important sequencing is to understand what's taking place. So I'm trained as a geneticist, actually. And to us, we kind of view a cell like a black box, what goes in and what comes out. Biochemists drop a bomb on it and look at the pieces. Now, that sounds like I'm being disrespectful, and I'm not. They're different approaches. And so that's why it's not a surprise if you are at your heart a geneticist, as I consider you to be, um, this is not a surprise that you like this approach. One very quick story about you at Illinois is your PhD advisor actually had the former lab of the late, great Carl Woese. Yes, and, we were and in what his did, space. And what did you find in one of those drawers? Oh my gosh, very early um, after joining that lab, um, still setting up, getting things settled in, into the new lab space, and we opened a cabinet or a drawer, and we found a bunch of um, gel images, um, the actual like film from back in the day, technology that I've fortunately never had to use, but the actual when they would <laughs> transilluminate these gels, um, and make these, um, these films and just tons of them in the drawers. And we, we, we looked at each other and we said, oh God, should we take a few home to frame them? But we didn't. Um, <laughs> we, uh, contacted higher ups in the university. They got whisked off to some archives. Um, but yeah, I got to hold some of Carl Bose's physical, um, gel images um, and there's a lot of famous pictures of Carl in a lab space that later was renovated slightly, um, but was where I, where I did my PhD. For the listener and viewer, Carl Woese was really, really important in showing that there were three basic domains of life, eukaryotes like ourselves, my beloved bacteria, and these things that we now call the archaea which some might think look like bacteria, but are as different as different can be on that basis. And the way that he looked at this in the 1970s and 1980s was extremely laborious, and he would have these photographic films using radioactive gels so it would expose where the different bands were, and he would look at the patterns over and over. And I have to tell you that the way that Woes did this work is just amazing. You got to be a part of molecular biological history. And I am still deeply disappointed that you didn't secretly steal one of those from me. But what did Indiana Jones say in, in the first Indiana Jones movie? It belongs in a museum. And it really did, didn't it? Yeah, definitely. So the other thing that I wanted you to tell the viewers and listeners about is that there's a great deal of reductionism in science. The idea that you stick with one particular area and you just research it to death, and there's a lot of value to that. But at the same time, you've maintained a broad diversity of interests, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, can you talk a little bit about the other things that you've looked at besides the role of the vi of bacteriophages and the gut microbiome? Yeah, um, so I'm interested in phages really broadly. Um, so I'm really fortunate. I participate in the Microbial Diversity course at Woods Hole, um, the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, uh, every summer, uh, first as a student and then later as a teaching and research assistant. Uh, so I've been um, studying other viruses there. So much like bacteria, which are everywhere, viruses are everywhere. Everything gets infected by viruses. Um, so whether that's humans, plants, fungi, bacteria, um, even 
Doc, did you know about mitoviruses? Yes, I do. Okay. For the listeners. Hello, I, I'm Mark Martin. Have we met? <laughs> I, I am always trying to impress you. I was really hopeful that I could share something new with you. When it comes to like really weird information, I, I, I live for that. I, so, I should expect this from you. That's all um, right. For the listener, mitochondria are um, organelles in eukaryotic cells that, evolutionarily speaking, were once bacteria. So they were once symbionts um, of eukary early eukaryotic cells. Since then, they have sort of been co-opted by us and other eukaryotes to be a permanent entity within our cells. Um, but those bacteria had viruses that infected them, and it seems that there are still viruses that infect those mitochondria. Um, so that's that's really fascinating. Um, but a total a total aside because I have never worked on mitoviruses yet. Yet, you know, it's interesting because, and this is relevant to what you're talking about. I remember my absolute fascination when I learned that E. coli itself, one of the best known organisms on the planet actually has a number of what are called defective prophages. That is to say that they, there have been like at least 14 or 15 infection events where the viruses have become, and I call this Darwinoed, so they no longer leave the genome. And 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 they're just like the, the rusting evolutionary hulks of, of viral infections. And I think everywhere we look, we're gonna see ele we're gonna see elements of that. And that's oh, been, yeah, been your feeling. Yeah. Bits of these viruses, they get left behind. They get co-opted by their hosts. Um, a lot of the best pathogens out there have these dead or defective prophages left behind in their genomes, and they actually help confer to these pathogens a lot of their disease traits. Um, but it's also true for symbionts, actually. Uh, so there are symbionts of tube worms deep in the ocean that could not be symbionts if it weren't for remnants of integrated phages in their genome and the genes that those phages brought with them. Um, so it can go both ways. Uh, phages can make pathogens or they can make better symbionts. Um, so yeah, I, I am a huge fan of prophages. That was a very big part of my PhD, was looking at how these prophages change the interactions between um, uh, the interactions between bacterial symbionts and the human host. Uh, so I looked at a lot of metabolic effects of phage infection. Um, so for example, um, phage BB01, which was my prophage of particular interest in my PhD, uh, infects uh, what was called Bacteroides vulgatus, which we now call Fosea cola vulgatus. When it infects, it actually causes uh, the vulgatus host to stop degrading bile acids, which is really interesting uh, because symbionts in your colon, that's one of their really beneficial effects is to break down the bile acids that we secrete into our guts. They help us digest our food and then bacteria act on them, break them down a little bit and it helps to actually recycle them back through the body. Um, and also to manage, you know, digestion, inflammation, all sorts of other things. Um, so this phage actually impacts that whole process. And so, um, yeah, they are truly impacting every bit of life that they touch. It's, it's really interesting to think about uh, what I was taught to call phage conversion, where there are certain types, and we should probably draw the distinction because some bacteriophages, um, when they invade a bacterial cell, are committed to the destruction of that cell. They're called lytic bacteriophages. So they replicate and they cause, you know, ha we call it happy birthday when that happens, which is a good piece of humor if you know your phage biology and you do. But what I would go further than is there's another type that are called lysogenic phages. And these will actually integrate themselves into the host chromosome and become like a hitchhiker. As long as the bacterium is doing well, the bacteriophage is basically replicating well along. And it's been known for many years that some types of lysogenic bacteriophages can confer single gene advantages. For example, uh, shigatoxin E. coli, botulinum toxin in Clostridium botulum, that, that kind of thing. 
I also want to say, doesn't it annoy you when they change the genus name of bacteria? I, um, you know, I wanted that genus name to change. If it were up to me, I would have picked a name that was easier to say than Fosea yeah. cola. But I was a big proponent of splitting splitting the bacteroides up. I have no problem with it happening. It's, it's what you'll notice is it becomes like the older the person is in the field, the more uncomfortable they are with the changes. I remember when Pseudomonas was just a grab bag where they put everything, and, and, and that's just not a good thing. But I do want to draw one distinction, and you're the right person to ask, because if you ask anyone who thinks that they know a little bit about microbiology what the most common organism in the human gut microbiome is, they generally say E. coli, but that's not true, is it? It's not. Um, and if it is the most common organism in your gut microbiome, you probably have a problem. Um, really, the most abundant organisms in your gut are either from the Bacteroides and its close relatives um, or the Clostridia and their close relatives. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's really the bulk of what's inside of all of us. So, Danielle, can you tell the viewers and listeners a little bit about this kind of forest of bacteriophages? How do they actually get into the gut? Yeah, so they get in pretty much the same way that everything gets into the gut, um, fecal oral root. Um, so they come in both as viral particles, or as we talked about before, as prophages. So you could have a bacterium, it's already infected with uh, a bacteriophage, it reaches the intestine, and then that prophage decides, hey, I found a new home, I bet there's lots of new hosts for me to go live in here. Um, and it decides to skidoo and leave that host <laughs> and go find new ones. Um, so yeah, so it comes in same way everything else comes into our gut. Basically, I think this is me and you obviously can disagree with me because you're a colleague. Um, I always thought that E. coli was an oxygen sink. So it was able to help and maintain the anaerobic status. That is the lack of oxygen in the gut, because many of the organisms that live there cannot tolerate oxygen at all. And E. coli can. Do you think that that's reasonable? You know, I think the major oxygen sink is us. Um, the, <laughs> the epithelium in the gut is actually pretty oxygen starved. Um, and so really they are grabbing whatever ox, those epithelial cells are grabbing whatever oxygen they can get, um, higher up in the intestinal tract, like the small intestine where there is more oxygen, that might be the case that E. coli is kind of eating up the oxygen that it can, but there's also a lot of other microbes further up, further up the tract. I don't think anyone listening or viewing understands how delighted I am with this conversation. I've always said I learn more from my students than they learn from me. Nothing has been truer than my association with former students of mine who then become teachers to me. And I'm so delighted for you sharing that with me, Danielle. Oh, of course. I love, I love teaching, Doc. You taught me that very early on, and it's a big reason why I stay involved in teaching now, whether that be in Woods Hole or um, I help students with their qualifying exams here on campus. I really think that teaching is one of the best ways to learn. Oh, it is. Absolutely. Now, I, I want to be careful about time. When you were, uh, and, and the, um, microbial diversity course at, at Woods Hole at the MBL, transformational for me. Um, is there one quick story from there before we get on to gut and phage? Oh, sure. So um, as a student at the microbial diversity course, everybody gets to do an independent project. Um, I chose for my independent project to enrich for giant viruses that infect two different protists. So protists are, of course, eukaryotes that are single-celled. Um, so we can put up an image here of Oxyris marina and um, Filaretta ramosa. These were the two protists that I chose to work on. Um, and 
wanted to enrich for giant viruses that infect them. So as the name implies, giant viruses are huge on a virus scale. Um, they're as large as some of the smallest bacteria, if not larger, um, which makes them though very hard to work on. Uh, so both of these organisms are predators of bacteria. They eat bacteria. Um, and so it makes it really hard to, how do you separate the bacteria from the viruses, which is why I took an enrichment approach. Um, tried to target the uh, cell wall of the bacteria to deplete them from my enrichments. I think it worked out pretty well. Ended up doing some sequencing. I saw some really cool um, phenotypes change, especially in Corallomyxa. So this is um, an amoeboid organism that makes these net-like networks. It sort of lays down on a surface and <laughs> makes this mesh, uh, and then it reaches out with these little fingers and grabs its bacterial prey and pulls them in uh, and digests them. Uh, and I saw that after doing my enrichment multiple rounds that it was sort of falling apart, um, which might be a sign that this infection really was working. Uh, but giant viruses are really cool. We think that they sort of evolved this largeness because they mostly infect these organisms that eat bacteria. And if you eat bacteria and you reach out one of your little amoeboid hands and you feel something that seems approximately bacterial size, you might pick it up and think it's food, but it's actually a virus ready to infect you. Um, so that was a really, really cool project to uh, dive into. What I'm delighted to hear is an attempt to look out in nature at strange new things. And, you know, there's no grant money for that kind of that kind of approach. And maybe that's just as well. I don't know. But the fact is, if you heard about the story of these net making protists, because that's what they were. They're using it like a fishing net. And not only did Danielle do that, she went further. She said, all right, if the net is starting to break down, that might be a sign of viral infection. And that's not the kind of thing you could get a lot of grant money for. So hooray, huzzah. And huzzah for programs like microbial diversity that actually support that sort of exploratory science without really you know, putting on that pressure to get the, the funding for the big stuff that's going to, you know, make dollar signs later on down the road. I'll put some links to that program in the show notes. It certainly was transformational to me in so many ways, and it's been transformation transformational for you as well. I mean, to the point where I wish I could take it again. It ain't never going to happen, but I wish that I could because so many opportunities to learn. I'd like to take a moment and, and move on to your major issue, which is looking at bacteriophages in the gut microbiome. And are you using a mouse system for this? Uh, a little bit. Um, most of my experiments now do not use mice. Um, I use a lot of tissue culture cells. Uh, so it turns out you mostly don't need a whole organism to recapitulate these bacteria. So you've got bacteria, you've got the eukaryotic host, and then you've got these phages. Um, and they're all talking to each other, right? I used to think about them as like Russian nesting dolls, where the phage was in the bacteria, was in the host. And that is true to an extent, um, because those sort of layered interactions do occur. Um, but in reality, all of those nesting dolls are also screaming at each other all the time. Um, but you really don't need a whole organism to rebuild that in the lab. We can do it in a, in a Petri dish. So, so take us through a simple experiment to kind of give the listener or viewer uh, an, an idea about your approach. Sure, yeah. So um, the main approach I use is called viral tagging. Uh, so this is a single-celled approach. Um, I can apply it to either bacteria or to eukaryotes. Um, but so when I'm doing it with bacteria, we take uh, like a human stool sample, very glamorous, uh, separate two fractions from that sample, the bacterial cells and uh, any virions. We stain them with two different fluorophores so that they're different colors, and then we recombine them. So now you are letting those viruses find their hosts. We don't know what the viruses are. We don't know what the hosts are. And then we sort them. So we get individual bacterial cells that have one or more viruses decorating their surface, and then we sequence them. 
So you get this sequence that has both the bacterial host and the little genomes of all the viruses that are associated with it. And so we're sort of reconnecting these viruses with their hosts because that's one of the major limitations in the field right now is we know there's huge amounts of diversity in the gut um, as far as phages go, but we don't know who they infect or what they do. So if I'm understanding you correctly, you're using what I was taught to call fax sorting, fluorescent yep. activated cell sorting. And for the listener or viewer, it's a tiny droplet, um, microfluidics, so that each droplet contains one particle. In your case, phages attached to a cell. Because of the fluorochromes, you can then use lasers and notice which one is fluorescent and then use electrostatics to move that into a new area. It's a really remarkable technique for sorting things developed originally in cell biology. Delighted you're using it for this context here. And what I particularly enjoy is that since you don't, it, there's more diversity in your gut than in any rainforest ever. And, and you really, I mean, you need a pith helmet to explore this stuff because it really is some something out of the 1920s with unexplored territory, right? Oh, yeah. And, and, and so that's what I'm trying to say is that this is an approach to you don't know who you're going to get. So that's how you're using phage tagging to find out a phage and a host of the phage. The only question I have is I know that some bacteriophages have a very broad host range and others a more narrow one. Have you seen have you seen evidence of that? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so we've seen the same or very similar phage sequences pop up on some very diverse uh, microbes, like across an entire phylum. Um, the one caveat to this technique, though, is that we're just seeing phage binding. We can't prove infection, right. at least not yet. But it's sort of taking that first step to start to ask those questions and do those actual infection experiments. That's a very cool approach. What has been some of the really, uh, really wonderful things you found? By the way, you have that wonderful review paper. And I am going Thank to you. post a link to that review paper so people can, can read your wonderful prose. I am so proud of you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, had a lot of help on that paper. But yeah, it was really wonderful to write. Um, this idea of, I say it here as all of everybody in the room is screaming, but um, that paper, I think we did a good job of laying out what those screams actually are and what we, what we know about them and what we still have to ask. Um, so yeah, so um, as far as experiments that are complete or nearly complete, I've been looking a lot at uh, Fecalibacterium recently. So Fecalibacterium is one of these highly beneficial microbes uh, in the gut. Uh, it's not as abundant as the Bacteroides. Pretty much everybody has Bacteroides in large numbers. Yes. <laughs> uh, Fecalibacterium is one of these symbionts, though, that is really indicative of a healthy gut. Uh, so we know it gets depleted in a lot of conditions like inflammatory bowel disease, which is one of my systems of interest now. Um, so we took this viral tagging approach, and instead of taking all of the bacteria from the gut, we took just Fecalibacterium. So we cultured Fecalibacterium in the lab, used that in the viral tagging. So now you have Fecalibacterium, which is a known, and then you have all these unknown viruses that you bind to it, and then you sort those out. Um, makes it a lot, a lot easier to figure out which parts are the virus and which parts are the bacterium. We talked about prophages. If when you don't know the host and the host genome, it becomes very hard. Is this sequence a prophage or is this a phage that's on the outside? It becomes a really hard computational problem. Um, but yeah, so I've been doing this with Fecalibacterium. Identified a whole whole lot of new diversity that infects Fecalibacterium. Uh, we know a little bit about Fecalibacterium phages right now, um, but I think this will add a lot, especially when it comes to single-stranded DNA phages uh, that make these filaments. So these are really cool phages. They have very short genomes, um, but they're, um, they're really abundant and they're really diverse in the gut. And uh, yeah, so we're starting to put together sort of what are these guys doing when it comes to Fecalibacterium, but then also when it comes to disease. So we're actually able then to make connections um, because our samples are coming from humans who are either healthy 
or have inflammatory bowel disease, we can make connections like which of these phages is actually more abundant in disease versus health and make inferences and ask more questions about how are these phages impacting health and disease. This is really cool. On the one hand, when you talk about single-stranded DNA viruses, I mean, it takes me back to M13, well before your time, which was used in the early days of DNA sequencing because it's a single-stranded DNA phage. Um, and, and, you know, no one had really thought that had any relevance to things. And you're discovering that the single-stranded phage can have real relevance. I also appreciate the fact that you can use some bacteria as indicators of quote, healthy, and quote, disease state. I know these are complicated ways of describing things. And, and, and that, you, you know, I've made a joke of it. You've heard me say it, that I've never done anything in my little lab that has benefited humanity at all. But you see, you can Hard disagree on that point. Um, um. <laughs> but so you're doing things that have to do with human health, which is fascinating to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's been, I think, really rewarding. Um, so for me, like, I don't know, it's just another ecosystem that's yes. really, really cool. Um, but then you can extend it out. So you take this, there's cool ecosystems everywhere, but when it has to do with health, it one makes it easier to get funding and, you know, publications, things like that. Um, but then you can make all of these broad extensions um, to other variables like health, um, what's actually happening in the human. Um, I have a lot of experiments going right now where we're actually doing this same viral tagging approach. And as our cellular bait, we're using human cells. And so we're actually looking at viruses um, from the gut, which are mostly bacteriophages, directly interacting with those human cells and starting to ask questions about what those interactions are doing. This idea of the virome is an interesting one, and I know that Maya Breitbart has, has dealt with that in a lot of contexts. And I mean, in, in even when I, I have my students look at water bottle buddies, I'm wondering about the virome there as well. And it's interesting because you think about the number of cells in our body, and then you think about the number of bacteria, and I understand the 10 to 1 rule doesn't exist. It's more like 2 and a half, 3 to 1. I understand all that. It's an interesting topic how that number was arrived at. But more to the point, there are many more viruses than there are bacterial cells or archaeal cells or cells in general. And it really is something like dark matter. Uh, it's, it's very hard to find one molecular chronometer to study who's who. It's very different than... than um, I hate the expression living versus dead when it comes to viruses. You know how that goes. It gets crazy quick. But my point is you don't have that single thing like we have with ribosomes to, to know about relatedness between organisms. The best you can do is try to very much again, like the early explorers of rainforests, just take pictures and compare and look for patterns. Yeah, it is a lot of looking for patterns. And these these viruses are so incredibly diverse. Um, but they're also evolving constantly. So, like, I have samples in my freezer from the same human person just a week apart, and you see, you see similar things, but they've changed. Um, and it's all happening so fast. And really, um, earlier you described lysogenic and lytic phages, uh, which I really appreciate. You know, we need definitions, and it's much easier to have definitions for things that fit into these little bins. But really, this sort of mobile DNA, which includes viruses, it's more like a continuum. So they're all yeah. diversifying and evolving together with their bacterial hosts all the time. And it makes it really hard, um, but also I think really, um, I, I enjoy the challenge. It's very enriching to sort of chase down these patterns. You know, I have a saying that the hand of Darwin is on everything that lives. And 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 I would include even, quote, non-living uh, elements like viruses. The, the constant evolution is a natural thing. And we see it with regard to antibiotic resistance. We see it with regard to even in your own experiments. I see it in my own experiments. And, and 
one of the things that I always caution people is that when you study organisms in a laboratory setting, it, they're quite different than how they were, quote, in, in the wild. And so this is wonderful work. So this is a really exciting area for you. And again, I particularly like your, your information about possible tags for disease state, which is really interesting. What has been the, the most exciting thing that you've found? But actually, we should do what is the biggest disappointment first, and then the, and then the good one. So what is the thing that really broke your scientific heart? Oh, boy. The thing oh, that you know broke me. Of course I'm going to put it that way. Oh, I did not prepare well for this question. No, the that's thing why that I did broke it. my scientific heart. Geez, Doc, I don't know. Uh, I got a million, so that's okay if you if you don't I mean, have any that. I think maybe it's just that I'm very used to having my heart broken <laughs> at this point. I don't know. Like recently, I've been doing a lot of 16s PCR, um, yeah. which is something you know, very basic um, by most standards, but I haven't done it in a couple years and I am struggling. It's funny how rusty you can get with a particular, you know, something as basic as PCR, um, but I'm rusty. So that, that sort of thing happens to me quite a lot. Well, you know what PCR stands for? Polymerase pipette, chain reaction. A pipette, cry, repeat. Right. That's that's where I'm at. Um, and, and you I remember guess you remember what I told you in lab is is that there's the re and research. It's so frustrating when you have a wonderful result that you can't replicate, and I don't believe it till I see it three times. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I I think a lot of folks don't understand that about science. It really is exploration, and it's all about kind of fine tuning. And to actually demonstrate it and to feel feel really confident about it. Sometimes science gets a bad rep uh, where people rush to make a conclusion. Uh, I call it the Yelpification of science, which we need to really stay away from. Um, but science is great because you can actually form a hypothesis and you can falsify it. You can show whether it's true or false from this designing. And there's no better feeling than that, which brings me to what is the single thing that you're most proud of from your current postdoctoral work? Oh, gosh. For my postdoctoral work. Um, so I described to you this fecaliphage, fecalibacterium phage, I abbreviated as fecaliphage, um, viral tagging experiment. Um, so these are a pure culture of fecalibacterium. We have the complete genome sequence for this microbe, um, and it makes it very straightforward to then, after we've added viruses to the mix, to subtract that host genome and identify the viruses, right? Um, we actually have instances now where we see that these phages are integrating in, you know, it's a half an hour for me to walk you know, walk across campus to the cell sorter, load them on. They're on ice the whole time, which should slow things down, um, but it's still happening. So it's it's been um, really striking to me. Like, I know that I know these things happen fast, but no matter how hard I try to slow them down or stop them, it's still happening. Um, and it's I'm I'm just really excited about that because prophages are just so near and dear to my heart. Um, but really, speaking of prophages and accomplishments, I'm super proud of the work I did during my PhD on these prophages in Bacteroides, which are incredibly prevalent and I think very important in many ways. Um, and we haven't talked about Abigail Selliers, who was also at the University of Illinois. We inherited her strain collection, um, and... I'm very proud that I was able to name this new group of bacteriophages after her. She didn't work on bacteriophages um, directly, but uh, we now have Sellier's viruses to talk about, and they're very important to some of her favorite uh, bacterial hosts. You know, Abigail was very important to me. Uh, she was I my think. instructor at Woods Hole, and uh, I have many things to say about the person that I called Hurricane Abigail, because she was. 
And it, 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 I'm actually a little teary from, from what you did there, because I, I think Abigail didn't care whether or not people recognized the fact that she was a wonderful human being and brilliant. But I think it's so great to know that she's remembered in this fashion and even greater to learn that a student, a former student of mine, actually did that naming. That's a wonderful thing. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I didn't know Abigail personally, but by all accounts, she was truly a force of nature. And yeah. She stood by me through some very dark times and she didn't have to. I won't talk about how I learned to collect my own bacteroides. She, she, yeah, that's, that's, that's another story entirely, but that's Abigail for you. You couldn't be very dignified around Abigail, but you learned a lot. So I wanted to, I wanted to say, this sounds like a wonderful thing. And what, I don't know if a, if a lot of listeners and viewers know how the profession of science works. One idea is that you earn your PhD learning how to be a scientist and then your postdoc is about, or postdoctoral, I shouldn't say postdoc, your postdoctoral work should be about, you know, learning what system you want to, to follow up on, kind of like a apprentice versus journey person kind of approach in the trades. And now you're at the situation where you're going to be looking for employment. Tell a little bit of uh, the listeners and viewers what kinds of things you're looking at for your future for you. Yeah, so I'm really only looking at assistant professorship positions. Um, these come around on a cycle, so I'll be primarily looking in the late summer and the fall. Um, but yeah, hoping to launch my own lab, uh, continue a lot of this work on Salyers viruses, um, sort of looking at those uh, interactions there. One of the very cool things about Salyers viruses I haven't had a chance to mention but I'm very eager to follow up on is that these phages that infect bacteroides, they only move from one host to a new host when there is a mammal around. Um, and so this is in the original paper. Um, we had a collaborator do this experiment with mice. Um, and I've, I've constantly blown away. No, no culture dish condition can recapitulate infection with these viruses unless there are mammalian cells. And now that I do tissue culture and cell culture, I again can tell you that that holds up. But whether it's a mouse or just cells from a mammal, there is some signal there that's telling these phages, hey, it's time for you to go find new homes. Um, and I, I still don't know what it is. So that'll probably be a big part of my lab is following up sort of on that three-part uh, interaction that's occurring there. Um, I'm also very eager to continue a lot of this viral tagging work. Um, Fecalibacterium has been my major focus uh, in the lab here, but there's no shortage of other microbes to look at, both symbionts and pathogens. Um, so if we look at symbionts, can we think about, you know, sort of other indicators of health and disease in the phage world? Um, but then also if we look at pathogens, can we find new viruses to maybe help us fight these pathogens that could be leveraged for phage therapy? Um, so phage therapy is where you use these phages to kill the pathogen instead of using traditional antibiotics, which we now know is very problematic for resistance reasons. What kinds of, are you looking for a place to be at a PhD granting institution or where are you looking? Uh, you don't have to give yeah. names. <laughs> <laughs> Ideally, I would be at an R01. Um, Good. But yeah, I'm, I'm looking to have more advanced students. Not that I don't adore undergrads. Um, I have a couple of, well, actually, as of a few weeks ago, no longer undergrads. They are now techs in our lab. Um, who are staying on to work on the phage side of things, and I adore them both. Um, but yeah, it's it's certainly, it's hard to, I, I admire you a lot, Doc, because you get undergraduates for this long, and then they're gone. And it, it just sounds so hard to um, both continue and eventually complete a project when it's occurring in little snapshots like that. It's really true. And for me, I, I have felt, and, and again, 
I want to be clear, this is just my opinion. I think every student has to have a project that's theirs. And you know, for example, in our chemistry department upstairs, uh, everyone works on the same project in most laboratories and progress is much more rapid that way. Um, also, the pandemics had a horrific effect, but you know that's something you and I can talk about. All I know is I think, and it's, it's very clear from this podcast, it's very clear from my knowing you, you'll be a fabulous applicant for almost any program. They would be so lucky to have you join their faculty. Thank you. And, I really appreciate that. And by the way, listeners and viewers, that is a hint. <laughs> Just so you know. Do you, I, I, I would like to say that something that I need to demonstrate is an image that Danielle put up that demonstrates her affection for Della Vibrio and her affection for bacteriophages. Um, I, I have tattoos and this is what Danielle has. And what it demonstrates to everybody is true commitment. Do Commitment, you, but also a bit of obsession at this point. What's the difference? <laughs> you say obsession like it's a bad thing, and it's not. <laughs> you're committed to you're committed to learning more. I mean, this is something you and I talked about. I don't know if you remember, is that and, and I want to be very clear that science as a profession has gotten better than it has been in the past. Doesn't mean there aren't problems to be solved now, but it's better than the past specifically with regard to work-life balance. But you kind of know you have to be a scientist when you want to see what things look like the next day. You want to open the incubator, if that's what you're doing, and seeing something really interesting. And that level of excitement, like what am I going to see on the plates, to be trivial about it, never gets old with me. How about you? Oh, absolutely. I... <laughs> I, I have a hard time uh, with the work-life balance stuff, um, mm -hmm. but but yeah, like all of the, you know, the stepwise nature of what we do, you know, put it in the incubator, come back the next day. It's always, it's always exciting. I, I'm always happy to come in on a Saturday morning, even if it's just for an hour or two, mm -hmm. just to move some plates around or run a gel or something like that. I want to know, you know, the suspense is killing me. <laughs> and, and that's the important point to really emphasize to listener and viewer. That isn't somebody staring down their nose at you or brainwashing you. That's something that you feel. And, and to me, that's no different than a person who has some kind of hobby that they really love. And we're lucky because we have a profession that's like a hobby. And that's a really remarkable thing to consider. So I, I often uh, ask people a couple of things at the end of, of, of one of these podcast interviews. And, and the first thing that I want to ask you, Danielle, is to the listener and viewer, what is one thing that you would like them to remember about your work or to know about your work? In other words, why would someone really want to know more? Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, the main thing is that it's happening. So these interactions between phages, bacteria, humans, everything in the gut. There's all there's so many components to the microbiome. We didn't even talk about archaea in the gut, fungi in the gut. You might have protists in your gut. You could have worms. Like there's so many things that could be I hope you don't, but you could. Um <laughs> there's so many things that could be in there and they're all talking to each other all the time. Um and this is happening in all of us. We don't we don't have a choice about it. So I I I say I'm obsessed with it, but also it's just a part of who we are. Um, well, it's happening all the time, and we really don't yet have a good grasp on what it means. You know, Danielle, it's funny that you say that because, you know, honestly, they were here first. Right? You know, that, it's true. that first evolved, last extinct. You know, the whole thing that, that I've been talking about for years. And so it's not a surprise. And there's a, a gentleman. Uh, Joshua Lederberg, Nobel Prize winner. Um, I have some concerns about the late Dr. Lederberg because I was friends with Esther Lederberg. But um, the reason I bring this up is he had a saying that's always with me, and it's not about quorum sensing. What he said is the microbial world is talking all the time. We just don't know the frequency. And 
you know, it's interesting when people talk about quorum sensing, as we did, for example, in the last segment of this podcast, there are just a few chemical signals. But what you've taught us is there's this cacophony of biological noise, everyone trying to essentially outshout one another. And it's really an interesting way of looking at it because we're all living things. We all have our own agenda. We're made up of living things. You, you know the saying that any living organism is just a bag of other organisms walking around? And, and, and there's real truth to that. And, and so all of these different things have come together into this assembly called Danielle Campbell and, and Mark Martin. And, and we're made up of all these different parts doing all these different things. And yet we are having that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it constantly blows me away. Um, but to your point of, uh, first evolved, last extinct, they really, they really did come first. We evolved yeah. and we just made a nice little pocket for them to call mm -hmm. home, evolve and, you know, figure out who's most fit in that environment. Um, and I really hope, you know, I work on the gut, but I really hope that later in my career, some of the things that I find maybe we can extend to other ecosystems because oh. they're the patterns, they, they occur everywhere, whether that be somebody's gut, the soil, the ocean, it's, it's happening all the time, all around us. Did, did, and you, inside ever, of us. did you ever take ecology here? I did. Yeah. So you rem you remember Evelyn Hutchinson, uh, who I, was the ecologist who did lake biogeography. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's in the 1920s and 1930s. And what the gentleman did, I believe is at Cornell is he showed different layer, different layers of the water had different kinds of organisms that lived there. So it's kind of sort of how the idea of the niche came about. So Carl Zimmer wrote a really wonderful uh, essay, which I'm going to include in the show notes called the human lake where he takes the human body and compares it to a lake in the way that Hutchinson did. It's a little dated now because it's not recent, but it really shows what you're saying is that it's easy to say that the human body is different, but it isn't. It's just another series of, of ecological niches where an exploits a strong word, but where they live. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, and the diversity in the gut is remarkable. Yes. But it, it still exists everywhere. Yeah. All of these, you know, fungi, archaea, they coexist inside of us, but they also coexist everywhere else that we look. I, I couldn't agree more. Danielle, it is such a pleasure to speak to a former Doc Martian. Uh, I hope that someday I have some biological organism named after me, but that's not going to happen, I'm pretty sure. I have a funny story about that from Woods Hole, I'll have to tell you. But it means so much to me to learn about the, the Salyers viruses. That's, that's wonderful news. I want to wish you and your two-legged and four-legged pack in St. Louis the very best of luck on what you're doing. And I hope that you'll keep me posted about your job search. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Doc. It has been such a pleasure. I always enjoyed chatting with you. Thank you so much. This has been Matters Microbial, a weekly podcast about the wonders of our microbial world and the people who study it. You can send questions, suggestions, or comments to me at mattersmicrobial at gmail.com. Show notes with tasty links, as always, from today's episode can be found at microbe.tv slash mm. If you enjoy our work, please consider supporting us at microbe.tv slash contribute. I'm Doc Martin, and you can find me in the biology department of the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Dr. Danielle Campbell is in the Baldridge Lab at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Many thanks, as always, to David Renata for superb editing and Reaver Clark for the wonderfully quirky music. I hope that you've all enjoyed being part of our Quality Quorum today. See you next time on Matters Microbial.